Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander viewers are advised that the following program contains images and voices of people who have died. Hello and welcome to this commemorative program to mark the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. I'm Dan Borsha. And I'm Kumi Taguchi. On the 15th of August 1945, Japan's Emperor Hirohito announced the end of hostilities. Unlike the mass celebrations that marked that momentous occasion in 1945, surviving veterans are marking this year's commemoration in COVID-19 confinement, sharing their memories with friends and family in private, rather than with their comrades or with public parades. But it's on these significant anniversaries that we take the time to remember those who made the ultimate sacrifice. The Second World War was the bloodiest and most destructive conflict in global history. Cities were destroyed by air raids. The atom bomb was dropped on Japan and six million Jews died in the Holocaust. More than 60 million soldiers and civilians died. It came just a generation after the war to end all wars had finished. The madness of trench warfare of mud, gas and death had left the world shell-shocked, but not enough that it stopped a new wave of carnage on an industrial scale. More than one million Australian men and women volunteered to serve in the war. Over the next half hour, you will hear their moving accounts of courage and bravery, from the heroism of Tobruk to the calamity of the fall of Singapore. These are some of their stories. The war that consumed the world started with a peace treaty, but the Munich Agreement failed to appease Adolf Hitler's expansionist plans. At dawn on Friday, September the 1st, 1939, the Germans launched their land, sea and air offensive on Poland and the world quickly became aware of the power of Hitler's Third Reich and his ruthless ambition. The Blitzkrieg, lightning warfare, was spearheaded by panzer tanks and the speed of Germany's conquest was matched by its brutality. Two days later, Australian Prime Minister Robert G. Menzies addressed the nation at 9.15pm on every national and commercial radio station. Fellow Australians, it is my melancholy duty to inform you officially that in consequence of a persistence by Germany in her invasion of Poland, Great Britain has declared war upon her and that as a result, Australia is also at war. It was one of those moments where everyone knew exactly where they were when they heard the news. I was sitting on the floor beside the wireless and Mum had been to church and she came in from church, came in bursting through the front door saying, Phyllis, turn the news to the ABC. And then I turned it on to the radio and I heard the, the solemn voice reporting that England was at war. I can remember that as plain as anything. We were all sitting around a table, the family, the sisters, my mother, and then my mother started to cry. And the boyfriends all sort of said, well, look as though this looks as though it's it. I was babysitting and I had the radio on and he said, and Australia is now at war. I thought, wow. I got so excited. I thought it was wonderful. <laughs> Grabbed the baby and I ran all the way up to our house burst in through the front door and stopped and there was dad and mum. Dad standing there, mum's got his arms around mum and mum's crying under his shoulder and he kept saying, it's all right Meg, it's okay. The war will be over by Christmas. Pat and Jim won't have to go. My two brothers and I thought, Pat and Jim at the war? No. All the excitement, there was nothing, just drained away and I thought, no, I don't want that. And the war didn't finish, went on and on and Pat went away and then Jim went away and, and I was, became an ambulance driver and that's how we saw the war out. And it wasn't pretty. 
I don't ever want to see another one. It seems strange today that so many Australians would willingly go halfway across the world to defend king and empire. But it was a very different world and a very different Australia. One which had unwavering loyalty to Britain. There is one task in front of us, and that is that we, the people of Australia, should do as much as the people of Great Britain towards the winning of a war which is our business just as much as it is their business. Australians had been hardened by the experiences of the economic depression, the ruthless campaigns of the First World War, and the relentless lottery of death in the stalemate of trench warfare. Within two months, 75,000 young men had signed up to fight in campaigns against the Axis forces across Europe, the Mediterranean and North Africa. So I there walked in the recruiting office at the Malvern Town Hall, 15 years of age. He said, what's your date of birth? I said, 15 second, 20. So it may be 20 years of age. So on my official army record, I'm 100 years old next February. For the first time in Australia, women were recruited and became a vital part of the war effort. Keen as mustard, both young and not so young. Among the thousands who gathered in Centennial Park, there undoubtedly were many who came to giggle. But they remained to praise, for the girls put on a grand show. In a war that envelops everyone, Australian womanhood is splendidly doing its bit. Nor in the blaze of glory must we overlook the unsung heroines voluntarily toiling over sewing machines, knitting needles, soldiers mending in the camps. As the nation mobilised for war, one in seven Australians would wear a uniform. In January 1940, the 6th Australian Division sailed into Egypt, just 25 years after their fathers died on the fatal shores of Gallipoli, a glorious defeat which forged the legend of the Anzacs. This time, the threat came from Mussolini's Italy. At the outbreak of the Second World War, Australia's military was tiny. We had a very small army, uh, the militia, we had a very small navy, and we had a tiny air force. So when the war broke out, one of the things Australia does contribute to this global effort is men. So we provide soldiers for the second Australian Imperial Force. So these were volunteers, and they volunteered to serve anywhere in the world for the duration of war. Australian forces joined the Allied campaign against the Italians in Libya, which culminated in the capture of Benghazi in February 1941. The German Africa Corps, led by General Erwin Rommel, came to the aid of the Italians, arriving in the capital of Tripoli in March to push the Allies back to the port of Tobruk. Tobruk was considered vital in the Allied efforts to cut off the Axis powers from Egypt and the Suez Canal. Under the command of Australia's Lieutenant General Leslie Morshead, Australian and other British Commonwealth troops were told to hold Tobruk at all cost and were besieged in the port for eight long months. Surrounded by German and Italian forces, the garrison valiantly held the port against daily tank attacks, artillery barrages and dive bombing stukas. The diggers knew the only way out of Tobruk was if they were killed or wounded. I shall never forget 10 men losing their life at the one time. The most scary part of it was the shelling at night. The mortars and what flying over and other ones that you just heard whip bang and you know that was pretty close and then sometimes you'd hear a thud and one would hit the ground, didn't go off. <laughs> Supplies of food and water were scarce, ferried in by the Navy, the so-called Scrap Iron Flotilla, who travelled through the sea route between Alexandria and Tobruk that notoriously became known as Bomb Alley. The men of the Tobruk garrison endured the desert's searing heat, the bitterly cold nights and hellish dust storms. 
They lived in dugouts, caves and crevices, plagued by flies, fleas and illness. The grit and defiance of the Australian soldiers shattered the myth of German invincibility and earned them the moniker, the Rats of Tobruk. It was the Gallipoli moment from the Second World War. Endurance, improvisation, um, mateship, humour, all those key characteristics of what we now assume to be the Australian identity. Tobruk was eventually taken by the German-Italian armies in June 1942. In October, the Australians played a significant part in the Battle of El Alamein. It was the first clear-cut and irreversible victory inflicted by the Allies upon the Axis forces and signalled the beginning of the end of Hitler's reign of terror. And you have proved it to my satisfaction, and I'm sure to your satisfaction, and I'm quite certain to the enemy's satisfaction that you can meet him and beat him whenever you come in contact. And remember that you are now members of a tried army of an AIF that in spirit and quality is second to nothing that is fighting in this war. Remember that you come from the finest country that there is. And let it always be proud of you. Australian airmen also played a key role in the bombing offensives against German targets. Sadly, more than one third of Australian personnel who served with Bomber Command were killed in action. Loyalty to the Empire left our forces divided across the world and Australia was ill-prepared for a new threat as many thought the war would be won or lost in Europe. For much of the population, Australia seemed like a nation at peace. Your men march to fight. They look to those on the home front to do their job, to give substance to a rising song of hope. Hope for a world in travail. Japan was taking advantage of Hitler's war in Europe to advance its own ambitions in the Far East. In the late 30s, Australia, Great Britain and America declared an economic war on Japan. The Kasamamaru is the last Japanese ship to leave Australia probably for some time to come. She carries more than 100 Japanese, most of whom made hurried preparations for departure. They take with them their goods and chattel. The devastating blockade was implemented in response to Japan's occupation of French Vietnam. All of Japan's assets were frozen and vital exports, including oil and rubber, were banned. The last Japanese ship was ordered to leave Sydney Harbour on the 15th of August. There were instances of the well-known oriental distrust of a camera, some of them extreme. These tropical islands, now under Australia's guardianship, thus form lonely outposts of the Royal Australian Air Force, vital links in Australia's defence. Native soldiers, fierce bushmen from Papua's untamed wilds, help guard this right-hand end of the strategic line running from Singapore. At 7.48 a.m. on December the 7th, 1941, the Japanese retaliated. 353 Imperial Japanese aircraft launched from six aircraft carriers and bombed Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. Less than 24 hours later, the British stronghold of Singapore was also attacked by Japanese planes. Two days later, we were at war with Japan. It was the first time Australia had declared war on another country as an independent nation. The dark shadow of Japan's new order spreads, first northward, then west and south, but chiefly south. South towards oil, rubber and rice, tin and gold. In just 10 weeks, Japan achieved a series of victories, resulting in the occupation of much of Southeast Asia and large parts of the Pacific. The war to us was in Europe, and we had heard about the Japanese that invaded was it China and all the way down, but somehow they didn't worry us, because they told us in Singapore that it was impregnable. It was uh, defended by this mighty naval base, and there was no threat. 
And when I heard uh, that they'd landed not nearly as far from where I was shaving as I had hoped, uh, there was a great sense of urgency that came, and he said, you wanted at the mess. And I remember one of the great decisions we had to make at the mess, which I imagined we'd be deciding on some profound tactical issues, it was what to do with the beer supplies, with the mess beer supplies. And uh, some one or two suggestions were made, and then some brilliant tactician moved that we drink it. And that was carried unanimously. With British guns pointing south, anticipating a sea assault, Japan mounted an audacious offensive, battling through the jungles of Thailand and Malaya to attack Singapore from the north. The Allies completely underestimated their new enemy. We had been told that the Japanese uh, physically were limited in operating aeroplanes. We, we had not the slightest idea they had the uh, competence and the equipment that they finally turned up with. The most significant thing was that we were told that they couldn't see. Didn't wear glasses. Bloody terrifying. <laughs> Fought like maniacs and the equipment they had was just what you should have had in a war at that time in the jungle. The campaign lasted just a week, and the capture of Singapore was the largest British surrender in history. You couldn't believe it. From our lovely life we'd had, and this right in the middle and all this destruction, and the casualties coming in, it seemed so. Some of them were young men we'd, you know, met out socially and that, and there you had them in all wounded and some of them died. It was terrible, really. We lost an entire division and more than 100,000 Allied soldiers became prisoners of war, including more than 15,000 Australian soldiers and nurses. One in three POWs would die. Most became victims of their captors' indifference and brutality. I was next to the ulcer ward and uh, the treatment in the ulcer ward was that the, the orderly would come around in the morning and his treatment was a sharpened spoon. So with a sharpened spoon, he would scrape away all the, the bad flesh down to the good flesh and he'd hear these blokes screaming as this orderly was going on his round. So you can imagine if you're next in line waiting for this fellow with a sharpened spoon to come down until finally there was no, no other action but they'd cut the leg off. One officer uh, amputated 40 limbs. The fall of Singapore remains one of the greatest military defeats in the history of the British Empire. The fall of Singapore was a strategic calamity. It was a tidal wave, a tsunami of disaster. And with the fall of Singapore to the Japanese, it essentially left the Pacific and Southeast Asia open to the Japanese. During those first few months of 1942, the Japanese could move at will, both through at sea and by air, and the Australian mainland is vulnerable and under threat. It was one of the darkest days in our wartime history and brought about a seismic shift in foreign policy for the Australian government. The invasion of the Australian continent appeared imminent as we became the target of Japanese air and sea attacks. Just four days after the fall of Singapore, the first attack on Australian soil occurred when Japanese planes bombed Darwin, killing more than 250 people, destroying the port, nine ships and 20 aircraft. The bombing of Darwin was a wake-up call for Australia. We realised our northern coast was exposed to Japanese attack. In response, one of Australia's most unusual and effective reconnaissance units was formed. A thousand kilometres of the Arnhem Land coast was patrolled and defended by 51 Aboriginal volunteers overlooking land and sea to sound the alarm at signs of enemy aircraft. They were vital to the north of Australia. We all come together, we fight for one. We fight for our land. When the Japanese come, we all shoot them, and we all kill them. 
With the fall of Singapore and the Japanese imperial forces storming towards us, the newly appointed Prime Minister John Curtin made the strategic decision to shift allegiance from Britain to the United States in a bid to secure military support in the Pacific theatre of war. Churchill wanted the Australians deployed to Burma. Curtin demanded them home immediately. A diplomatic feud followed and it triggered a monumental shift in our national identity. We feel that our fate and that of the United States of America are unbreakably linked. We know that our destinies go forward hand in hand and that we will stand or fall together. American General Douglas MacArthur, having suffered a humiliating loss of 70,000 troops in the Philippines, was evacuated to Australia where he took command of the war effort. MacArthur and Curtin prepared for an invasion on Australian shores, led to believe this was Japan's strategy after the bombing of Darwin was followed by shelling over northern Queensland and Newcastle and a midget submarine attack on Sydney Harbour. I was on the upper deck of a harbour ferry, which was a tremendous explosion, and after that, everything seemed to happen at once. As a newspaper man, I expect excitement, but I certainly didn't expect to be nearly torpedoed in Sydney Harbour. With the Japanese army inching closer to Australia through the Pacific, the young men of the 39th and 53rd Militia, or Citizens Military Force, were placed on a cruise liner turned troop ship at the Aquitania headed for Port Moresby in New Guinea. Many in the 53rd Militia Battalion from New South Wales were press ganged off the streets. They were objecting, I'm sure. There were women screaming out to their husbands or brothers or something or other. We found out afterwards they were, they were taken out of their house at home that day, that morning, and marched to a, probably a camp and then straight onto the boat. The young, untrained conscripts were not legally allowed to fight overseas, but would fight in New Guinea because it was, at the time, an Australian mandated territory. Nicknamed Choco, short for chocolate soldiers, they were initially taunted by the volunteer AIF but after coming face to face with Japanese soldiers for the first time along the Kokoda Trail, the boys soon proved their worth in the face of harrowing conditions and treacherous terrain. Oh my God, that walking. The first half an hour, I thought, no, I'll never do this. I was exhausted, but I didn't like to show it to, to anyone, particularly to the country blokes, because they were going along all right. And that, after he got to Uberi, I was absolutely stonking. We all learned to smoke pretty much there. And the, one of the jokes there were that, for some reason or other, the department issued us with condoms, a packet of condoms. <laughs> well, of course, all the condoms were used for was to put your tobacco and matches in to keep, because we're, half the time we were crossing rivers and creeks and in, uh, in wet conditions, uh, the only thing you could do to keep the tobacco and matches dry was in a condom. <laughs> First attempting to invade and capture Port Moresby by sea, the Japanese Navy was stopped by Australian and American fleets in the Battle of the Coral Sea. The Japanese then looked to take New Guinea by an overland route, landing in the northern area of Gona, trekking south to confront the Australians who were setting up camp and an airfield at Kokoda. Our troops were under-resourced and unprepared for the unrelenting horror of jungle warfare. The Japanese have developed the camouflage of their troops to a very high degree. Near Kokoda, they've been wearing deep, close-fitting greenish steel helmets with green veils to cover their faces. And the net result is that they're extremely hard to see. Our guerrillas have had to camouflage their own uniforms. But the ordinary troops are still wearing their light khaki, which stands out in the jungle like a German field grey uniform in the Libyan desert. Kokoda came to symbolise our struggle. The precipitous track through the rugged and frightening jungle of the Owen Stanley Mountains was the scene for terror and bravery in the face of a fanatical enemy. In my opinion, the Jap will be harder to defeat than the Hun. The reason is simple. The Jap is a fanatic. 
He never gives in. He dies where he fights. We'll have to kill Japs and their hundreds of thousands to reconquer the countries they have taken. Rather than be captured, Japs have been known to hold a hand grenade to their head and pull the pin out. But in the face of horror, death and hardship, our troops persisted in their campaign to defend Australia. On the day we attacked, we had advanced and there was less than 200 metres between us and a young Australian soldier. Naked on top, wearing only his shorts, holding a grenade, ran towards us and threw the grenade. Even the Japanese army would not have the courage to commit such an act. The caring local Papuans acted as carriers for our sick and wounded soldiers, lovingly nicknamed the Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels. They also helped transport stores and equipment over the rough mountainous terrain. Over two years of fighting in New Guinea, around 625 Australians were killed along the Kokoda Trail and over 1,600 were wounded. Casualties due to sickness, including malaria, dengue fever and dysentery, exceeded 4,000. This Japanese officer, and uh, when he broke through the q and I, we were face to face with each other and I think he was just as bloody scared as I was and I was just lucky that I could bloody pull the trigger first. Anyway, uh, that was an experience that uh, I wouldn't like to uh, ever handle again because that haunted me for years. When I went through this bloke equipment and that uh, was part of my job, I found he had photographs of himself and his wife and the three little kids. On the 6th of August 1945, the world's first atomic bomb was dropped on the Japanese city of Hiroshima and the second dropped three days later in Nagasaki. The bombs obliterated the cities and instantly killed more than 100,000 people, tens of thousands more later dying from the effects of nuclear radiation. The war had come to an abrupt end and the shock waves of destruction left in the wake of the two atomic bombs rippled throughout the world. Japan announced its surrender days later on August the 15th. Japan has been disarmed. Emperor Hirohito's imperial army is home in defeat. There was confusion in Japan as the emperor's voice was heard for the first time on the radio. He told the nation the war situation has developed not necessarily to Japan's advantage. He never used the words defeat or surrender. Indeed, some imperial forces continued to fight until the 1970s. The demise of the Japanese military would shape the country for generations. Post-war Japan is defined by its downfall. Japan's formal surrender came on the 2nd of September on board the USS Missouri, overseen by General MacArthur, American soldiers and high-ranking representatives from nine allied nations. I must pray that peace be now restored to the world and that God will preserve it always. The war was finally over and our servicemen and women and surviving prisoners of war could finally return home. Home from the damp and the sweat, from the leeches and mosquitoes, from the fear of the jungle stillness. There was dancing in the streets after victory in the Pacific. The gruesome, exhausting and costly war was finally over. Hello everyone, this is Talbot Duck Madden speaking to you from Martin Place, Sydney. It's about an hour since the official news came through. There are thousands and thousands of people. Honestly, I've never seen so many people in Martin Place before. But it was a bittersweet moment for many Australians whose loved ones would not be coming home and everybody was excited and they all took the, the wars over. The war the was finished. And there was a woman staring at the fruit and I went over to her and I said, did you hear that? I said, the war is over, it's finished. And she just turned around and she said, my two sons were killed in Tobruk. It'll never be over for me. In war, 
nobody really wins, in my humble opinion. lasting six years and costing the lives of up to 85 million people. This year marks the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. All in all, close to a million Australians, both men and women, would serve. Half of them overseas. It was in the skies above Europe and the deserts of North Africa that Australia's skill, bravery and endurance came to be known in legendary battles like Tobruk and El Alamein. But then came Japan's entry into the war on the 7th of December 1941. A date which will live in infamy. Its rapid advance through Southeast Asia and across the Pacific would come to define Australia's war. All up the mainland was bombed nearly 100 times during the war. Northern Australia bore the brunt of this assault. But fear and panic spread when Japanese submarines began shelling Sydney and Newcastle. Merchant ships were sunk up and down the east coast and a passenger ferry was torpedoed in Sydney Harbour. As the war dragged on, the mammoth effort began to pay off. Japan surrendered on the 15th of August. Japan's final surrender took place in Tokyo Bay aboard the American battleship Missouri in the presence of the Commander-in-Chief of the Australian Army, the Chief of Staff of the Australian Forces and high-ranking officers of the Allied Forces. Rejoicing broke out spontaneously all across Australia with wild scenes of celebration. Australia suffered heavy losses in the Second World War, but it also emerged confident and with an independent outlook. There are four words carved on stone plinths at the end of the Kokoda Trail. Courage, endurance, mateship and sacrifice. These words perfectly sum up all those Australians who fought overseas and on our doorstep and who supported the war effort on the home front. My name is Dr Matilda House. I was born at the end of Second World War in Cowra. And this morning, we join with you at the Australian War Memorial to commemorate the 75th anniversary at the end of Second World War. As a very proud Nambri woman, we begin the service today acknowledging the Nambri people, the custodians of the land on which we are meeting here today, and pay our respects to elders past and present. I extend this respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today and those who are viewing this service from home. As we honour the past, and the present who served, and the people 
that did serve during the Second World War over 75 years ago, many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, men and women that served for this country. In Australia's Defence Forces, they were equals, not so when they returned. Standing beside me here today is my great-grandson, Michael House, a very proud Ngambri man who proudly wears and is representing his family of the James's grandfather, his great-grandfather's medals, Frederick James, who served at the Royal Australian Air Force in the Second World War and Vietnam War. As First Nations peoples, we have and will always continue to protect our land and our country as we move forward into the generational changes of no more wars. Thank you, Michael and I. Thank you so very much. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to Aircraft Hall within the Australian War Memorial Canberra for the National Commemorative Service marking the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. I would also extend a welcome to the many Australians who may be watching this broadcast at home in cities and towns throughout Australia. My name is Warren Brown and it is my great privilege to be your Master of Ceremonies for this morning's service. I will now broadly acknowledge our official guests. His Excellency General, the Honourable David Hurley, Governor General of the Commonwealth of Australia, and Her Excellency Mrs Linda Hurley. The Honourable Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister of Australia. The Honourable Anthony Albanese, Leader of the Federal Opposition. Mr Andrew Barr, Chief Minister for the ACT. Mr Alistair Coe, Leader of the Opposition for the ACT. General Angus Campbell, Chief of the Defence Force, and Ms Stephanie Copas Campbell. Senior representatives of the ex-service community. Veterans, other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I would now like to acknowledge our national treasures of today's service the veterans here and at home of the Second World War and all the families who are watching this service around Australia. To everyone here and at home, I would now ask that you please stand and acknowledge the service and sacrifice of all Second World War veterans and their families. Thank you. By the beginning of 1945, Australians had been at war for over five years. Now they believed that the Allies would be victorious and hoped that both the war in Europe and the war with Japan would soon end. In Europe, the Germans surrendered on the 7th of May, just a week after the death of Adolf Hitler. Australian prisoners of war in European prison camps were liberated and Australian service personnel began returning home. Three months later, devastated by Allied bombing and the threat of invasion, Japan surrendered. The Japanese announced their surrender on this very day, the 15th of August, 1945, in effect, ending the Second World War. And Australia rejoiced Crowds gathered in streets across the country and strangers danced together. Japanese forces across Asia and the Pacific began offering their formal surrender. Thousands of Australian servicemen and women now began returning home and surviving prisoners of war were repatriated back to Australia. With the war's end, hundreds of thousands of service personnel had to adjust to life as civilians. Many of the civilian women who had played such a vital role in the workforce during wartime were now expected to return to their homes to become wives and mothers again. 
The Second World War was fought on many fronts across North Africa, the Mediterranean, and the Middle East, across Britain and Europe, then closer to home in Asia and the Pacific. Almost one million Australians served during the Second World War. Some 39,000 lost their lives, and many thousands more were taken prisoner, wounded or injured in the course of their military service. Here, in the heart of the Australian War Memorial, the role of honour is inscribed on bronzed panels, listing those Australians who made the ultimate sacrifice. This morning, we begin the service with a role of honour to reflect on those who have died protecting and defending our great nation. We pay our respects. Today, Australia remembers. I've been volunteering for the Moor Memorial for 20 years. I look at the galleries and I look at the plaques on the wall. My own brother from Angau is on the wall. I never saw him after I left home. I go and say hello to him and I go and look at the Hobart, the Australia, the Sydney, the Yarra, all friends. I look at this and I just, I just pray for them. They were the biggest part of my life. They were my family. And the war memorial is their home. Those names on the wall, they mean so much to me. George Leonard, 2nd 1st Battalion, killed in action in Papua, 23rd of October, 1942. Harold West, 2nd 1st Battalion, died of illness in New Guinea, 26th of November, 1942. Keith Bluey Truscott, 76th Squadron, killed in a flying accident in Western Australia. 28th of March, 1943. Lionel Matthews, 8th Division Signals, executed while a prisoner of war at Kuching, 2nd of March, 1944. William Kibbe, 2nd 48th Battalion, killed in action at El Alamein, 31st October, 1942. Douglas Champkin, Mami and Carol, Hector Harrison, Eric Jarman, Ronald Neal, Francis Jackson, 460 Squadron, all killed in action over Germany, 28th of April, 1944. William Newton, 22nd Squadron, executed while a prisoner of war in New Guinea, 29th of March, 1943. Dora Gardam, 2nd 4th Casualty Clearing Station, died while a prisoner of war in Sumatra, 4th of April, 1945. Irene Drummond, 2nd 4th Casualty Clearing Station, executed while a prisoner of war on Banker Island, 16th of February, 1942. John Worley, 460 Squadron, killed in action over Berlin, 27th of January, 1944. William Forbes, 463 Squadron, killed in action over Germany, 21st of February, 1945. Dorothy Buddy Elms, 2nd 10th Australian General Hospital, executed while a prisoner of war on Banker Island, 16th of February, 1942. George Beale, 2nd 20th Battalion, died from injuries while a prisoner of war in Japan, 28th of May, 1943. George Morris, HMAS Perth, died while a prisoner of war at Sandakan, 29th of May, 1945. Albert Cleary, 2nd 15th Field Regiment, executed while a prisoner of war in Borneo, 20th of March, 1945. Lawrence Saywell, 17th Brigade Company, Australian Army Service Corps, murdered by an SS patrol, 
in Czechoslovakia, 8th of May, 1945. Maxwell Beisler, 2nd 24th Battalion, killed in action at Tobruk, 1st of May, 1941. Alfred Gillard, SS Ceramic, killed in action in the North Atlantic, 7th of December, 1942. Colin Dossiter, 1st Australian Paratroop Battalion, died in a parachute accident in Australia, 23rd of August, 1943. Oliver Dossiter, 2nd 14th Battalion, killed in action in Syria, 24th of June, 1941. Ladies and gentlemen, the service will now officially commence with the mounting of the catapult party of Australia's Federation Guard. Catapult party, quick march. Catapult party, present arms. Catapult party, reverse. Catafalque party, slow. Catafalque party, rest on. I now invite General Angus Campbell, Chief of the Defence Force, to deliver the call to remembrance. Seventy-five years ago, a weary Australia laid down its arms and felt the first joyous stirrings of peace. In the forest of Borneo, the soldiers finally laid their arms 
and had paused to listen to the songbirds in the trees. Ships across the Pacific spliced the main brace and an extra ration of rum warmed a sailor's heart. The engines of kitty hawks, boomerangs and bow fighters were quiet, even if their celebrating crews were not. At home, telegrams bearing the saddest of news slowed to a trickle and eventually stopped. An entire country had been called to serve, to defend what was right and good. A great victory had been won at great cost to all. One million Australians served, answering the call of their nation and building on the finest traditions of their Anzac forebears. Throughout the Second World War, almost 40,000 lost their lives in the line of duty, with many others wounded or taken prisoner of war. Millions more stepped forward to serve their country in other ways during this time of need, whether as volunteers, through donations, or by filling the gap left by those gone to fight. We remember them all today. Australian women answered the call. 24,000 women joined the Australian Women's Army Service. Thousands more enlisted in the Women's Royal Australian Naval Service, the Australian Army Medical Women's Service, and the Women's Auxiliary Australian Air Force. As farmers left to serve abroad, the Australian Women's Land Army stepped up to feed the nation. Overall, 200,000 Australian women joined the workforce during the Second World War. People from a diverse range of backgrounds, skills and capabilities answered the call. More than 5,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people served. Some were trailblazers, such as Captain Reg Saunders and Warrant Officer Len Waters and their families. Others simply followed in their long tradition of service to country and community. No one story can encapsulate the broad backgrounds, experiences and sacrifices of those that we remember today. Each one is noble, touched by sadness and deserving to be told. Two sailors reflect the extraordinary nature and range of duties carried out by Australian military personnel during the Second World War. That of ordinary seaman Edward Teddy Sheehan and third officer Ruby Boy. Edward Sheehan was born in Lower Barrington, Tasmania. When Tenney's country called, he enlisted on the 21st of April, 1941, following five of his brothers into service. Posted to the newly commissioned HMAS Armadale, the ship and her crew departed Darwin for Japanese occupied Timor to relieve Australian forces and evacuate both troops and civilians. In the afternoon of the 1st of December 1942, the Armadale was attacked by 13 Japanese aircraft and struck by two torpedoes. The survivors abandoned ship and were strafed by enemy aircraft. Teddy leapt to help free a life raft and then returned to his gun, warding off the airborne attackers. As the Armadale slipped below the waves, Teddy remained strapped to his post, serving his country and his mates till the last beat of his heart. He was 18 years old. Today we remember him, his service and sacrifice recently recognised and honoured by the posthumous award of the Victoria Cross for Australia. We also remember Third Officer Ruby Boy, a coast watcher in the Women's Royal Australian Naval Service, who was born in Sydney and living in Vanakoro in the Santa Cruz Islands. When Ruby's country called at the outbreak of the Second World War, she learned how to operate a radio and transmit weather reports in voice code. When the Japanese occupied Tagali and Guadalcanal, while others were evacuated, Ruby stayed, risking execution if she was captured. 
Every day from December 1941, she provided a weather report and relayed information from coast watchers further north. In 1942, she provided vital information during the Battle of the Coral Sea and the Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands. During her service, Ruby only received three personal messages. One on the death of her father, one on the death of her mother, and the third on the death of her sister. Ruby remained at her post. Today, 75 years ago, Ruby Boy received news over the radio that the war was over. Ordinary seaman Teddy Sheen VC and third officer Ruby Boy embodied the traditions and values of the Royal Australian Navy, the Australian Defence Force, and of all those who answered the call to serve Australia. An entire country answered that call. Today, we remember and honour them. From one generation to the next, they say to us, to you from failing hands we throw, the torch be yours to hold it high. Thank you, General Campbell. The commemorative address today will be delivered by the Honourable Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister of Australia. Today in suburbs and towns across the land, the last of a great generation are remembering a different time. A time when the joy of their youth was denied and forced to give way to the responsibility of nation, of adulthood, a time of sacrifice and struggle, of ration books, blackouts, heartfelt farewells on shipping docks, pencilled notes from battlefields, tear-soaked telegrams and of a great victory that changed the course of human history. During the Second World War, one million Australians wore our uniform and made the silent promise to give their lives for their country, if need be. Their tomorrows for our today. The names of almost 40,000 Australians upon whom that sacrifice was called, are inscribed here in their home at the Australian War Memorial. There are among 102,000 Australians who have given their lives for Australia in so many theatres. This memorial, located on Ngunnawal land and in direct line of sight of the parliament, is Australia's most sacred place. Here I am joined by three incredible Australians, themselves once part of a generation of young men and women who pledged their service to our country to defeat Hitler and the evils of Nazism, to stop the aggression and conquest of militaristic Japan, to defend our sovereignty, freedom and our way of life, and to defend an attack on Australia. Derek Holyoke, Lance Cook, Les Cook, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today. We're also going to be joined by Terry Lascelles, but she is unwell and she is watching from home. Terry was part of the Australian Army Medical Women's Service we just heard of. She nursed men in traction, cared for emaciated prisoners of war and tended to burn victims. Difficult work. Derek was 16 when he joined the Navy. He pretended to be 17. He was on the HMAS Hobart when it was hit by a torpedo. Lance was a flight mechanic. He kept our bow fighters in the air. He checked every spark plug to keep our pilots and navigators safe. And he said, they were my mates. And Les, like Derek, tried to enlist at 16. 
except the enlisting officer told him to try the scouts. Les wasn't perturbed. He returned at 17 and his dad signed up too. Why did Les join up? He put it simply. It was the thing to do. You didn't give it a second thought. There was another reason too. He said to stop the bully. No truer words have been spoken, but that's what happened. That's what they did. A country of seven million Australians united and became one in a mighty national effort to defend human civilization from the bullies who sought to destroy it. Derek, Lance, Les, there you were. Boys who helped free a world and be great men. You marched, you sailed, you flew in planes like the Kitty Hawk Polly behind me. You peered through binoculars and poured over maps. You washed the mud off your rifles in rivers and swatted mosquitoes in jungles. You said prayers on ships as the bodies of dead friends were committed to the deep. You battled sunstorms, snowstorms and torrential rain while carrying the heavy load of your packs this generation. You did all this with your nation behind you and always in your mind. Everyone played their part, living up to the call of then Prime Minister Curtin, who said, no one else can do your share. True then, true today. Australia wasn't alone. We stood with our allies and our friends. This was a global fight. All understood that if tyranny was not confronted together, eventually it would be confronted alone. True then, true today. Today we remember those we stood with, the airmen of Bomber Command, Fighter Command, Coastal Command, the Brits, the Canadians, the South Africans, the Poles, the Czechs, the Kiwis, the French and our many other allies. The Russians who withstood and turned back the Nazi war machine, the Indians who, took, who stood alongside us in Tobruk, in Singapore and elsewhere the villagers and local people in Thailand, in Burma, in Borneo, and even Japan, who defied the authorities and smuggled food to our POWs. The local Chinese communities in Singapore, Malaya, and elsewhere, who showed their own kindness. And how can we ever forget, as I constantly relay to Prime Minister Marape in Papua New Guinea, the fuzzy, fuzzy wuzzy angels of New Guinea the wonderful Solomon Islanders and all of our Pacific Island family and friends. The Dutch, the Kiwis and the ally who led the fight to free the Pacific, Pacific, our great friend, the United States of America. Today we call to mind all who stood with us and all we stand with. The names, the places, the battles are part of our national story. The rats of Tobruk, the HMO Sydney, Sir Roden Cutler, the campaign for Syria, where Gunnar Leslie Smith was also, my grandfather. Vivian Bullwinkle and the nurses of Banker Island, Weary Dunlop and the Thai Burma Railway, Teddy Sheehan, the HMS Adelaide, the Aussie Rules flying ace Bluey Truscott and the defence of Millen Bay, the stretcher bearer Bull Allen and the wounded he carried to safety up Mount Tambo. Nancy Wake, the white mouse who outwitted the Gestapo. Mabai Warasan, Awati Mao and the Torres Strait Islander Light Infantry Battalion. The sailors of the Coral Sea, Midway, the Bismarck Sea and Guadalcanal. The battles and campaigns, mainland Greece and Crete, El Alamein, Rabaul, Timor, Ambon, Singapore and so many more places where Australian blood was shed all of which was part of one great national effort. So Ben Chifley declared 75 years ago, fellow citizens, the war is over. On that day, Australians were seen spilled into the streets, laughter, dancing, thanksgiving, joy overflowed our nation. Derek was in Adelaide that day. He said, everyone went mad with joy. Everyone was kissed. The police were kissed. The horses were kissed. He said everyone got kissed but him. And from that victory, the most remarkable thing happened. 
from the ruins of war, sworn enemies became our devoted friends. And as I think of the peace that emerged, I think of Darwin today. The walk from war to peace to friendship has taken many steps. Small and big, they have all mattered. About 15 years after the end of the war, a Japanese salvage company was given the contract to salvage the wreckage that lay in Darwin Harbour. Amongst the metal salvage was bronze from the Australian merchant vessel Zelandia. The Zelandia had been sunk in February 1942. After the salvage crew returned to Japan, they melted the bronze and made it into 77 Christian crosses. The crosses were then given to a church in Darwin as a gift that had been built on what was the site of the United States military headquarters. That headquarters had suffered a direct hit during a wartime bombing raid. The crosses reflected the answer to a question asked in the Gospels. How many times must I forgive? The answer, 77 times. From war came peace. From peace came rebuilding. From rebuilding came reflection. From reflection, forgiveness and eventually friendship. And one of the most moving experiences I've had as Prime Minister was to lay a wreath with my friend and Australia's friend, Prime Minister Abe of Japan at the Cenotaph in Darwin. A complete journey. Prime Minister of Australia and the Prime Minister of Japan standing side by side, honouring Australia's fallen in Darwin. Now true friends and partners, so Derek Lance and Les, and the veterans like Terry who are watching elsewhere, that is the world you fought for, that is the world you created. And now, in your sunset, we honour you. We honour your generation. In my view, Australia's greatest, and we say thank you. You won a war, you secured the peace, and along with so many more saved civilization. Your deeds will never be forgotten. And we pledge this day to always be a good as country and always to be as courageous as you. Courage, mateship, endurance, sacrifice. May God bless you. May God bless Australia. Thank you, Prime Minister. I now invite Principal Chaplain Darren Yench of the Australian Defence Force to deliver the Prayer of Commemoration. As we pause in reflection, people of faith turn thoughts to prayers. If it is your want, join your thoughts with my words as I pray in my tradition, or in silence, reflect in your own way. God of eternity, Lord of the ages, we thank you for the many ordinary men and women from all parts of society who responded to resist aggression, to fight evil, to stand for righteousness, to protect loved ones and to defend freedom. Be with us now as we together remember and honour here at this place and in places all around this country. We are surrounded by memories of courage, of sacrifice, of loss, of faith. In remembering the end of hostilities some 75 years ago, we pray for the veterans of that time, everyday heroes who rose to the challenge of the tragedy before them, We pray for the faithful who remember and honour fallen mates. We remember those who have died, who rest in the shelter of your presence. For those wounded or killed in service, for those who suffered in body, mind or spirit. We remember those who have departed us as the years have continued We feel close to them and they will always be a part of us. 
We thank you for the goodness of their lives. We will never forget. Give us joyful reunion in eternity. We pray for families who always, in times of war, bear the pains of grief and the suffering that comes with the scars of those they love and with painful, oft unspoken histories. We give thanks for them and their love. We pray for the innocents caught up in humanity's folly. Deliver us from the prison of hatred against any enemy. Set us free from the powers of revenge. Liberate us from bitterness and anger. And help us to use the freedom defended and won in times past to make this world a fairer and better place for all. Eternal One, remembering all those who served the cause of peace and endured the horrors of the Second World War, we fervently pray for peace within the entire human family. Break down the barriers between people and between nations. Protect us from the threats to peace in every part of the world. And bless those who even now are working for true peace and the end of warfare everywhere. Bless our land under the Southern Cross. Forgive our failures, empower our efforts for peace. Bless all her people, ancient and new, that we may always remember the sacrifices of those who have gone before us. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain. We come now to a truly tragic yet heroic story of the war. Vivian Bullwinkle was born on the 18th of December in 1915 in Kapunda, South Australia. Vivian trained as a nurse and a midwife in the hardworking mining town of Broken Hill and later transferred to Jessie McPherson Hospital in Melbourne where she began her long and distinguished career. In 1941, at the age of 26, Vivian volunteered as a nurse for the Royal Australian Air Force, but was rejected due to flat feet. Nevertheless, she was able to enlist in the Australian Army Nursing Service. Sister Bullwinkle was assigned to the 2nd 13th Australian General Hospital and in September of 1941, sailed for Singapore. For a short time in Singapore, Vivian enjoyed the sights and nightlife the colony offered. But this ended abruptly when Japan commenced its invasion of the Malay Peninsula. After several exhausting weeks caring for the wounded, the nurses were eventually forced to flee to the port and evacuate. Vivian kept a detailed diary of her experience. The 65 nurses were assigned to the SS Viner Brook, a small coastal steamer packed with 300 passengers. To avoid attack, the captain planned to hide among the islands by day and travel only by night. Later, Vivian wrote her recollections of the events that followed. Retired early to a disturbed night with much shouting and ringing of bells. Found out the next morning that we were lost amongst minefields. And only Bill Sedgman's good navigating got us through. After two days at sea, the Viner Brook approached Banker Island. Saturday, 14th of February. Beautiful sunny morning, calm sea. But the peacefulness was disturbed as planes flew over and machine gunned our boat. All took to lower deck as prearranged, but the raid was over. Much discussion on planes sinking us and enemy aircraft. The captain now had no choice than to push on by daylight through the Banker Strait. Took up anchor and steamed along. Then at 2pm, air raid siren. All down to the lower decks and flat down. Six planes attacking once more. Bombs hit. Second time, third time. Third bomb below the waterline. Whistle for all on deck to take to the lifeboats. 
several civilians injured. As the Vinerbrook went down, the nurses remained on board to help the panicked civilians abandon ship. Matron Peschke then gave the order for the nurses to leap into the sea. Twelve nurses were lost when the Viner Brook went down. Some were killed by Japanese planes, and others, like Matron Peschke, simply floated away, never to be seen again. The rest of the passengers clung to bits of wreckage and began to make their way towards land. By the next morning, those of the Viner Brook were scattered along the beaches of Banker Island amidst dozens of other survivors. They had come ashore at a place called Raji Beach in enemy-held territory. The next day, Bullwinkle's group was joined by about 100 British soldiers who had also survived being bombed by the Japanese. The group was so large, they decided to surrender. When you're young and you've got a group of over 100 people, you can't imagine anything happening to that. And, and we confidently felt that we would be taken prisoners because of safety in numbers. The civilian women and children left to seek out the Japanese, while the nurses, soldiers and wounded waited. When Japanese soldiers arrived at the beach, they ordered the soldiers to go behind a headland where they were massacred. We just sort of looked at each other and said, they're not taking prisoners. And we seemed to accept that fact. Well, we're on the wrong side of the fence at the moment. This is our fate and we're not taking prisoners. The nurses were then ordered to walk in a line into the sea. When they reached waist deep water, the Japanese fired on them with machine guns, killing all but Bullwinkle, who was wounded. She feigned death until the Japanese had gone. When I was hit, I can remember thinking, oh, it's like the kick of a mule and then I went down <laughs> and again being young naive uh, I imagined that when you were shot you'd had it so that I was very surprised to find myself still alive And I just laid there and let the waves gradually bring me in. The Japanese had left. All the nurses and one civilian woman with them were killed except Vivian Bullwinkle. This was to become known as the Banker Island Massacre. Now, Sister Bullwinkle hid for 12 days with British Army Private Cecil George Kingsley of the Royal Army Ordnance Corps, tending to his severe wounds. However, after being taken captive, Kingsley died soon after from his injuries, which included a gunshot wound into his abdomen. Sister Bullwinkle was a prisoner of war for three and a half years and almost died under the horrific and atrocious conditions. Sister Bullwinkle was discharged from the Australian Army Nursing Service in 1947 and became the Director of Nursing at the Fairfield Infectious Diseases Hospital. She continued to serve in the Australian military forces and gave evidence at the Massacre War Crimes Trial in Tokyo in 1947. Bullwinkle was awarded the Royal Red Cross Second Class in March that year. She devoted herself to the nursing profession and to honouring those killed on Banker Island. Her services to nursing were recognised with the award of the Member of the Order of the British Empire in 1973, and was appointed Officer of the Order of Australia in 1993. She returned to Banker Island in 1992 to unveil a shrine to the nurses who had not survived the war. Sadly, Vivian passed away on the 3rd of July 2000, aged 84 in Perth, Western Australia. Vivian's story continues to inspire many Australians and her memory lives on as part of the Australian Nurses Memorial Centre in Melbourne, which Vivian was the co-founder of. The ANMC 
is a living memorial for fallen nurses and has provided ongoing professional development of nurses through education and scholarships. Lest we forget. Ladies and gentlemen, wreaths will now be laid by official representatives. The first wreath will be laid by His Excellency General, the Honourable David Hurley, Governor General of the Commonwealth of Australia, and Her Excellency Mrs Linda Hurley. The next wreath will be laid by the Honourable Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister of Australia, on behalf of the people of Australia. The next wreath will be laid by the Honourable Anthony Albanese on behalf of the Federal Opposition. The next wreath will be laid by General Angus Campbell, Chief of the Defence Force, and Ms Stephanie Copas Campbell on behalf of the men and women of the Australian Defence Force. The next wreath will be laid by Wing Commander Sharon Bowne, retired, on behalf of the Australian War Memorial Council. The next wreath will be laid by Mr John King on behalf of the Returned and Services League of Australia. The next wreath will be laid by Mr Rick Craner on behalf of Legacy Australia.
The next wreath will be laid by Mrs Meg Green on behalf of Australian war widows. And the final wreath this morning will be laid by Second World War veteran, Mr. Les Cook, who served in the Middle East, Greece, Crete, and Kokoda. Les is laying on behalf of all Second World War veterans, and he is accompanied by his grandson, Tom. It is now time to reflect and to silently remember all those who have served and died in war. Please stand for the ode, which will be followed by the last post, one minute of silence and rouse. The ode will be recited by Second World War veteran, Mr. Derek Holyoke, who was part of the North African campaign, including operations in Tobruk. party, attention. They shall grow not old, <coughs> as we the left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. Lest we forget. Lest we forget. Hannibal Party present arms. Folk party, shoulder, arms.
Please remain standing for the Australian National Anthem and the dismount of the Catafalque Party. Catafalque Party present arms. We began our service this morning with the mounting of the Catafalque Party. Now the Catafalque Party will dismount, followed by a fly past of historic aircraft. Catafalque Party in words. Turn. Catafalque Party, quick march. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our official national commemorative service to mark the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. To our special guests here today and at home, the veterans of the Second World War, thank you for being with us for this morning's service. You honour us by your presence. You are wonderful representatives of all those you served with you and we are so grateful for your service and sacrifice. Ladies and gentlemen, please show your appreciation. Thank you and good morning. As far as the men were concerned, if they had a, a mate or a person that came in, one of the boys that came in, they seemed to form their mateship very quickly and they'd look after them so well, you wouldn't believe it. The, uh, that's where, you know, they talk about mateship sometimes and I think it's got a hollow sound because in those days it was real mateship. They did anything for each other when they got home. There were some that had lost limbs and there were others who'd lost their minds. We did have men that were more damaged inside. They seemed to be pretending to be the big, strong soldiers. They were all quite young and they feared about returning to life and not being as they were. And I think that played on their minds a lot. The scars of war mark each one of us in a different way. Some obviously could never settle back into Seve Street remembering that these young men, most of them, 18 and some younger than 18, were thrown into this conflict situation, were finding it terribly hard to adjust, terribly hard to adjust. I think we all have learned a lot and have a great deal to be thankful for being able to learn the lesson of true comradeship, because virtually what one man had 
everybody shared. And although I wouldn't like to see any future generations having to go through such an experience, I have no doubt that if they do, they too will learn the value of comradeship really shines through under the most harshest of conditions. Grandchildren saying to their grandfathers, you know, your medals, Dan, Pa, can I have those, you know, later on? <clears throat> can I march with you? Tell me where you were. <laughs>